Hello and welcome to Network Africa. I'm Joker Rogers here in Lagos. We begin today in Sudan where the paramilitary rapid support forces has condemned the killing of the governor of West Darfur State, Kamis Abubakar, on Wednesday. But officials in Sudan are accusing them of murder. Sudanese officials had accused the RSF of killing the governor who had hours before said the RSF and allied militias were committing genocide against people from the Masalit ethnic group. But the RSF put out a statement saying the governor was killed at the hands of two outlaws despite attempts by its forces to protect them. The paramilitary force is demanding an inquiry into the circumstances that led to the death and said that it will not hesitate to bring to justice any member of its force found to have been involved in the incident. Well, Sudan's health sector was already on the edge of collapse due to a lack of resources before the conflict began, and it has been shattered by nearly two months of fighting between the army and the rapid support forces across the country. More than 60 hospitals in conflict zones have been put out of service, and the 29 that are still operating are threatened by closure due to power and water cuts and shortage of staff. And this has put patients who need constant care and close monitoring at risk of infection and death. We're now joined by VOA Africa correspondent Mohamed Yusuf in Nairobi, Kenya, to give us some more on this. Hello, Mohamed. Hello there. So what dimensions do you think this assassination of the Darfur governor will introduce to the conflict? Um, the late governor, he was one of uh, the leader of rebel groups from West Darfur who, ha who had a peace agreement with the Khartoum government back in 2020, 2021. There were several other um, uh, rebel groups that signed an agreement, peace agreement with the central government. Um, and now um, there have been also reports of, of communities there, particularly um, the um, uh, Bakar community have been complaining of uh, um, Arab militias and other militias supported by RSF targeting their communities. Some of those uh, men, people who crossed over to Chad have been have spoken about those kind of issues. Their communities becoming a target. But one one thing that uh, it's going to do clearly is that. Uh, there have been peace agreement between rebel groups and the central government, particularly Khartoum, with the with the national army. So it means that as war progresses, we are going also to see situation where some rebel groups who had agreements may be abandoning these agreements, peace agreement, or suspending it. And now that means that you're going to have all these militias now running on their own, managing their own affairs, and that complicating entirely the process, the the conflict itself. Now we are talking about the paramilitary RSF and the Sudanese National Army led by Al-Burhan and the other side, Hameti, you're also now going to have a situation where you're going to have many rebel groups who are abandoning peace agreements they had, whether with uh, with Janjaweed, now RSF, and uh, Sudanese National Army. And that will complicate entirely for, for, for the problem for the country. You were talking of two uh, rival groups, then eventually you're going to bring all these other rebel groups on the table if you want to engage them in peace talks. That is what is, that is the kind of uh, conflict or the deaths that now was announced yesterday by the governor is going to create more militias coming out and engaging on their own, running their own affairs and creating more problem uh, for the country. So on what basis was the Sudanese army accusing the RSF of committing genocide against the Masalet people? Is there any evidence to that effect? The late governor yesterday before his capture and killing um, complained and, and he raised issues of, of genocide or communities uh, being targeted. And, and this is, uh, the government seems to be going with the same script. But the last video of the governor shows that he was being uh, captured by RSF after that. Uh, no one knows really what happened. What had really happened is a conflicting information of what really happened to him. But uh, whether genocide, this that region has has witnessed many conflicts for decades, and uh, back in 2009, ICC International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant against the former president Al Bashir, um, accusing of war crimes and also genocide from that region. Uh, after the inter inter intercommunal conflicts have been there, when uh, the army came in, and there have been many abuses of rape and and people chased out of their homes. So it, that is. A Similar script, will it be there? Now many 
people focusing between the army and the RSF and the conflicts in Darfur and the peace talks between the two sides, particularly in Saudi Arabia and Jeddah, but seems to be forgotten what's going on in Darfur. There have been a couple of uh, sort of uh, peace in the last couple of years, but now the conflicts that uh, that started in between the two sides, the Sudanese army and RSF, seems to be igniting uh, that conflict there. And that creates a lot of problem for the communities there. Many people have fled and people are talking of buying homes, uh, places of worship, hospitals, and many people fleeing. There are also uh, particularly communities, um, the minorities there, the Masilit community, which uh, the governor will, uh, his community, the people of course over complaining of uh, the army not doing enough to protect, him, to protect them. Uh, there are also militias all over places attacking them because of their ethnicity. That's now igniting, uh, and this is what the war started, and we know the end result has always been complained of genocide and war crimes against those communities there. Well, similar uh, script will repeat it there, time will tell, but uh, as it is now, it seems to be uh, things are going that direction, and more militias now will be coming out uh, to defend themselves and intercommunal conflict now will return to that part of the region. Right, and the RSF is accusing two outlaws now. How do you think this will go down with the government since these outlaws have not been identified, so to speak, and uh, it does not seem suspect that the, does it not seem suspect that the RSF couldn't prevent or at least apprehend them? At the back of people's mind, of course, people remember the last images of the governor being taken in. After that, of course, there will be conflicting of what really happened. And uh, the government, of course, the Sudanese Nansha Army is saying that uh, they're, they're accusing the RSF behind the killing, RSF saying they are the outlaws. But uh, for his community, the Masalit and other his rebel groups that he was leading, uh, Sudanese, uh, Sudanese, uh, Sudanese liberation movement, um, will not be taking this very lightly, particularly also his tribe will not take this lightly. Um, they will remember the last images, and now this is going to ignite and will make his community now um, coming out to defend themselves and maybe also to carry out targeted killings in, in the parts of the country. That's what it is going to create as it is. But uh, the government will say what they want, RSF will say what they want, but particularly for his community, they are the ones who fill the pinch that he, they have lost uh, um, uh, their governor or their son. And for the rebel group that he was leading, they have also lost their leader. That is the script that will be played in that part of, of, of the country as, 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 as things develop uh, in the coming days. Right. So you just spoke about people feeling the pinch. People have lost the governor, but then there are other issues uh, in this war or this crisis in Sudan. I'm talking about infrastructure. Uh, a lot of people are getting affected. Uh, we've just spoke about hospitals that had to be shut uh, because they lacked power and they lacked uh, the resources to you know, get the care that people need. So how are people able to take care of themselves? What's been done in this regard? There is, there is a break of law uh, and order, of course, in, in that in many parts of the country. And, and we have also, from this program so many times, we have reported of, of people looting. And there have also been accusations. UN agencies have complained of looting, uh, looting taking place, militias doing RSF has been accused in part of that. So in, when that kind of situation happens, it's, it's really too difficult to know who is in charge. And in infrastructure, when there's bombings, there's street fights, there's just aerial bombardments, supplies are not coming in. People are, are left on their own. And people, uh, as always in many parts of the conflicts we have seen across Africa, people try um, to manage their affairs as it is. People will try to remain, protect their homes. And uh, people who find it may difficult also may try to leave. But for the hospitals, they we've seen many places that they they try to stay um, open until the last minute to a point where they feel they can no longer help people. But uh, as as it is now, we haven't seen many instances of that. They're trying to manage the situation. The supplies trying to coming in. 
people are getting assisted. But now with all this shortage of power, all this infrastructure being bombed, um, is is going to complicate um, the humanitarian situation there. And now it means the hospitals they can't do major surgeries, um, which of course will be coming out people in the conflict, injuries, all those sort of things. Now they're only managing, um, of course, the symptoms and and few injuries here and there, and give medication. But for bigger part, they will be abandoning those kind of situ those kind of treatments if uh, they they don't get any assistance or people uh, people who continue to engage in the fight don't respect uh, this kind of infrastructure. Right, uh, Mohammed, uh, thank you for updates uh, on that situation. Thanks for having me. Let's bring you more on Sudan. Of course, the health sector I just spoke to Mohammed about, which has already was already on the edge of collapse due to lack of resources even before the conflict began. Now everything has gone awry. Nearly two months of fighting between the army and the rapid support forces across the country has left more than 60 hospitals in conflict zones affected and put out of service. Take a listen. Kidney dialysis patients are dying and dead bodies have been left to decompose in a morgue and in city streets as Sudan's war rages on despite efforts by volunteers and aid workers to keep critical health care running. In El Obeid, southwest of Khartoum, a power outage lasting more than two weeks has put a kidney dialysis unit at risk of shutdown and led to the death of at least 12 dialysis patients. <laughs> Residents say roads into the strategically located city are under blockade, with supplies of food and medicine cut off. Engineers try to reach a local power station to restore electricity, but according to the doctors' union, were assaulted before they could arrive. Renal disease constitutes an important health problem in Sudan, where treatment is limited and expensive. According to the International Society of Nephrology, an estimated 8,000 people in Sudan depend on dialysis to live. In Ombada, on the outskirts of Omdurman, the main hospital has had to halve the frequency of patients' visits and shut down their operating rooms. The general director, Ala Eldin Ibrahim Ali, says this is because of power cuts and lack of fuel for the generator. The situation in Darfur in western Sudan is even more desperate. El Ganeina, the worst affected city, has been hit by waves of attacks by Arab militias backed by the ISF, while cut off from humanitarian relief and phone networks. Practically, there are no um, healthcare services at all in El Ganeina. It's a, it's a city of death. Uh, it's uh, probably the worst part of Sudan uh, currently. Uh, we know that uh, we spoke to numerous uh, healthcare professionals who fled to Eastern Chad, and what they are describing is just simply uh, horrifying and something that's completely heartbreaking. Um, so the bottom line is, yes, there isn't uh, uh, healthcare services in Algerina. In, in the entire region of Darfur, there hasn't been uh, supplies that reach the area because of safety situations. The Janaina Teaching Hospital, the most visited hospital in West Darfur State, was forced to close in late April. Its patients and doctors were evacuated. Sudan is now in desperate need of some agreements between warring factions to save the healthcare system and its patients from extinction. Welcome back. We head to South Africa where the Department of International Relations and Cooperation says there's been no official decision by the State Department or the White House to move the African Growth and Opportunity Act conference from the country. This comes as four members of the United States Congress presented a letter to the U United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, asking the White House to move this year's AGOA conference away from South Africa over the country's non-aligned position on Russia-Ukraine conflict. Our South Africa correspondent, Innocent Simosa, reports. 
The letter by the four members of the United States Congress to Secretary of State Antony Blinken requesting the removal of the Agoya meeting built for November has sparked a national debate over South Africa's stance on Russia's war with Ukraine. Political analyst Sanat Solomon says the United States is not necessarily declaring an economic war because of South Africa's position. As you mentioned, quite intricate. don't think that they're necessarily declaring war on uh, South Africa, but I also think that South Africa, while it's said that it is taking a middle stance in terms of this, has shown to be more partial towards Russia. And while it has not proven to be an actual threat to the U.S., the um, allegations in terms of South Africa possibly giving weapons to Russia could mean that uh, South Africa could be a possible adversary to the U.S. And I think that is one of the things that they are most cautious about. But I also think that just in terms of this AGOA, South Africa would be negatively impacted if the U.S. had to proceed in terms of um, removing the country from that list. Could South Africa lose its AGOA status? And what will this mean for the economy? The problem South Africa finds itself as it is now, and we've got to tread very carefully. We cannot afford to just shout and, and say they can go to hell. Because when we say that, it is not really going to do us any good. However, by the same token, the USA, when it, when it is threatening to remove us from ACOA, they will not do it. I'll tell you why. The USA needs South Africa in the same way as South Africa needs the, U the U.S. They're not doing us a favor by, by, by buying many things from, 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 from us. Trade between South Africa and the U.S. stands at around 10 billion U.S. dollars with thousands of South African goods entering the U.S. under the preferential trade regime. The country is one of the major exporters of citrus fruits to America importing just under 9 million boxes of fresh citrus fruits in 2022. That number jumped 300% to over 37 million boxes. The question remains, is Agoya still a big deal in South Africa? Or the country is better off trading with the BRICS nations? China accounts for 22% of, 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 of our total trade. However, note this. China has got the largest reserve dollar. And, and China does a lot of business with the USA. So will it make sense for us to, to cut down our trade? President Cyril Ramaphosa will lead an African peace mission to Russia and Ukraine in the upcoming days. Analyst says it's not enough. I don't think that um, the South African presidency is doing enough. I think that this is a very complicated situation and I don't think that we understand the nuances of this. If you look at this whole thing, it would have a ripple effect and impact on numerous South Africans' lives. As South Africa strives to overcome the challenges of the electricity crisis and inflation, the uncertainty around its Agoya status adds another layer of concern to its economic outlook. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Simos, Channel Television News. Stay with South Africa as we take a look at more economic issues. A South African politician has called for more trading platforms and a multi-currency system in international trade to offset some of the negative impacts brought by what the, he calls the U.S. dollar a monopoly. Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly of South Africa, Solomon Sinali, believes international trade should break the old model of a single currency and establish more trading platforms. The point is that uh, for any one country to have its currency as the dominant one in world affairs, and then it weaponizes it by arbitrarily taking decisions that affect negatively all the other countries. It's an unfair discriminatory practice and abuse of power. And this is why it is important that countries are beginning to feel that perhaps BRICS is an appropriate forum to move towards a different uh, financial settlement system 
rather than depending on the dollar which is being used in the way the United States uses it. Elsewhere now, the leadership of the National Association of Nigerian Students in Diaspora, led by Abdul Razak Abubakar, says it deeply appreciates the new Nigerian president, Bola Tinobu. A statement released by the group says, in part, the signing of the student loan bill marks the beginning of a new dawn for Nigerian students. Mr. President, Nigerian students in the diaspora hope that the new educational system would also cover the Nigerian students in diaspora because in the real sense, the Nigerian students abroad are not living in paradise. The statement goes on to relay challenges with payment of tuition using the current available means. The group leadership is suggesting a switch from form, from form A to M as an alternative to reduce hiccups in the system. The association expresses renewed hope in the government because of its attention to students' plight. And more than a dozen companies mainly from Saudi Arabia are bidding on 2 million tons of carbon credits as the Kenyan capital hosts what organizers have built as the world's largest sale of its kind. Demand for carbon offsets generated through a project such as tree planting or using cleaner cooking fuel is expected to grow as companies seek to use the credits to help meet net zero emission goals. The auction in Nairobi is being conducted by the regional voluntary carbon market company, which was founded by the Saudi Public Investment Fund and Saudi Tawadol Group. The certified credits are sold, uh, that are sold will fund either projects to avoid emissions by using sustainable technologies or remove carbon from the atmosphere. Wow, we're here to walk the talk. We are here on the ground in Kenya, Nairobi. We selected Nairobi to be our destination to shed the light on exactly what you mentioned, the climate change issues that we see here in Africa, which is something very important for us. So we're bringing with us here uh, 15 companies from Saudi Arabia, the region and international to connect the buyers with the suppliers. Uh, they have taken time commitment to come here for two years, uh, for two days, sorry. These are executives from these companies that are here on the ground in Kenya. So to give you an example of the auction that we're having today, we have two due diligence teams separate from each other, working on each and every project that we offer, uh, looking at additionality, looking at permanence, looking at uh, the co-benefits, and if there is any red flag, we immediately exclude uh, this from the uh, auction. 16 southern white rhinoceroses have been released into the Garamba National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo, reintroducing an endangered species that was decimated by poaching. The last northern white rhino in the park, which lies in the DRC's northeast, was poached in 2006. According to a joint statement from the park and conservation groups, the return of white rhinos is a testament to the DRC's commitment to biodiversity conservation. Yves Milan Nge, the director general of, uh, said of the park, said in a statement that the operation was led by the Congolese Institute for the Conservation of Nature, Conservation NGO, African Parks, and Canadian mining firm Barrick Gold, which sponsored the Rhino Move. Established in 1938, Garamba National Park is one of Africa's oldest for the conflicts, poaching, and, and chronic insecurity in volatile DRC have decimated its wildlife over the years. Fantastic opportunities to create new founder populations, reverse local extinctions and destination um, out of a continually producing population um, in Pinda Private Game Reserve. We're super excited that there will be a new range state with rhino populations and we hope that this is uh, going to be brilliant for, for rhinos themselves and, and that in 10, 20 years from now there will be a thriving population of white rhinos in Garamba and DRC not only for the benefit of the park and, and for the ecosystem there, but certainly for the people of, uh, of DRC. 
Well, that's the program today. Thank you for watching. I'm Jackie Rogers. Bye for now.